Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you are joining this webinar. Welcome to LMU College of Business Administration's special lecture series. My name is Young Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of Center for Asian Business and also director of the Center for International Business Education of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. This program is funded by DK Kim Foundation, benefactor of the Center for Asian Business and prepared in collaboration with the Center for International Business Education and Fred Kistner Center for Entrepreneurship. I know Mr. Kim is attending this webinar today, so I'd like to recognize his generosity to make an event like this possible to enrich our knowledge about successful business practices. As the oldest center for excellence within the College of Business Administration, the Center for Asian Business was established in 1995 to promote better understanding about the key issues related to Asia Pacific countries through special lecture series, conferences, training programs, and movie screenings, and contributed to advancing our knowledge about competitive global marketplace. Before we start the program, I'd like to recognize a few staff members who worked so hard for this event. First, Dr. Marky Jones, Assistant Director of the Center for Asian Business, and Ms. Darlene Fukuji, Associate Director of the Fred Kisner Center for Entrepreneurship. And finally, Mrs. Jennifer Tyler, Administrative Coordinator of the Center for Asian Business. We have a very special speaker today, since she's a former LMU family member who served as Associate Director of the LMU Center for Entrepreneurship. We are very proud of her achievement as a young successful entrepreneur who owns and leads a thriving global business with national distributors, hotels, and chain restaurants. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mrs. Maylin Yamamoto Tansinko. She's the founder of Chrome Made that produces and markets innovative sustainable goods for the food service and hospitality industry. The company's first patent product, uh, Crop Sticks, was featured on season eight of Shark Tank on ABC. Starting in March 2017, Chrome May's clients now include 200 plus restaurants, hotels, retailers, including Roy's Restaurants, Haksa, uh, Hakkasan Group, Disney Parks and Resorts, the Four Seasons. Mylon also runs a boutique talent management forum called Click Now, based in Los Angeles, that builds the careers of popular digital celebrities. Click Now's services include influencer, marketing management, packaging, and production. She holds an MA in communication from Cal State Los Angeles, and she currently teaches leadership and communication class at UCLA. And Mylan actually that they won the SBA's Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Mylan, it is very nice to see you again. I thank you so much for agreeing to talk to LMU community out of your very busy schedule. We all are very excited about listening to your successful story. First, I'd like to uh, ask you to make a brief presentation on your topic. Following your presentation, Professor David Choi, Director of the Center for Entrepreneurship, will join us to have a dialogue with you and also moderate the Q&A session with the audience. Audience, please click on the questions button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to submit your questions. At the end of the webinar, you will be asked to participate in brief survey. Okay, Marlin, now you can start your presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Pack. Thank you to you and the Center for Asian Business, Loyola Marymount University and the College of Business. It's such an honor to be here back with LMU community. And um, thank you to Dr. Markey and Dr. Choi and Darlene and every one of you for being here today. I know you could have a lot of different things to do at 5 p.m. Pacific time, but you chose to be here. So I hope this presentation will be of value to you if whether you're thinking about starting a business or you're interested in turning your existing business into something sustain of a sustainable business. Um, 
or you're interested in becoming an inventor yourself. So please leave questions. I'm open to answer them as best as possible. So first I'm gonna share my screen. I have a little presentation that will hopefully keep things interesting. Okay. Um, like I said, my name is Mylan Yamamoto Tansinko, and I'm the CEO of Cropsticks by CropMade. This is my second business. The first one is a talent management company called ClickNow. And that business, along with my teaching career and working at LMU together, all of that experience helped Cropsticks become what it is today. We're a proud certified B Corporation. And if you ever walk into a Whole Foods, or a grocery store and you look at the back of a packaging or you look at the tags on Patagonia and you see this big B uh, logo, that means the company's a certified B Corporation. And that what that means, it's a, it's a third party certification that holds the company to the highest standards of environmental and social responsibility. So for us at Cropsticks, it felt really um, gratifying to get the certification because you can be in your silo, in your niche, thinking you're doing the best you can for the environment, the best you can for the world. And uh, it's not until you ask a third party to look at your business and they look at it and they really comb through it. It took us two years to get this. We failed the first time, got it the second time. Um, and it looks at all the stakeholders of your business to see, all right, are you truly analyzing your suppliers? Are you helping your customers? Are you supporting your employees as best as possible? Are you supporting your community, your government, and your investors? So that's the B, a little bit about the Certified B Corporation. Our mission is to leave behind a greener environment for future generations. While our B Corp was, uh, we got that in 2019 of June, our mission has always been from day one. And this mission statement comes from the sentiment of, all right, everything that we're doing right now, is it gonna be better for my children? I don't have any yet, but if I do, I want them to have, enjoy the greenery. I want them to enjoy a clean environment, clean air. Today, we're in over 250 different restaurants. Um, some of them through COVID, and, and we can do that as part of the Q&A has closed down. Um, but we are very thankful to be resilient and be, being able to pivot during this time. And one of the, our pivots has been to um, focus more on to retail. And that pivot paid off because um, while we, we are going to be in 267 retail stores nationwide starting in spring 2021, this is our first national count. We've been in some regional markets like Walgreens and Foodland and CVS, but this is going to be our first national account. So we're really, really excited and thankful for that. Quick company overview. So we launched uh, in March of 2017. We're headquartered in Los Angeles with branches in Hawaii, Monaco, and Mexico. Um, whenever you see branches in another city or state, that basically means that the company pays taxes there. Um, but I can also later on in Q&A, I wanna talk about how to keep your overhead as low as possible. Just because you have a branch in another country doesn't mean you need to have this big, beautiful office, which is something I thought when I was going through college that you need to in order to establish branches. And we are a small team of 12. But I wanna go back um, to kind of the beginning because I know a lot of you are in college right now, college students, and thinking about your business ideas, thinking how you can get funding, how you can bring your ideas to life. Um, so for me, I was born in Hawaii, born and raised. Um, my parents are very, um, I had a very loving childhood. I think that was the card that I was blessed with, but I did not have the money card. My parents worked for uh, pub the public school system. My mom worked in nonprofit. So not a lot of money, but a lot of happiness. And uh, I remember the story of money where I, we had a school trip in high school and the, the high school orchestra, we got invited to go to Carnegie Hall. And at Carnegie Hall, it, it was very expensive going from Hawaii to New York. And my parents, unfortunately, as much as they knew it was gonna be a great opportunity, they said, hey, Mylan, we just can't afford it. So you can't 
you, you, you have to stay back from this trip. And I was really upset and sad at the time. And looking back, I'm like, yeah, that was a lot of money to send your, your kid. But this is my first taste of entrepreneurship where in high school, I would bake brownies and I would sell them to the kids that would skip, uh, they, they would skip lunch. They were the, they were the magic card kids. They love, they, I remember them clearly. They would sit on the, uh, they would skip class and sit on the side and play magic cards all day. They were my best customers because they were super hungry and I would bring the food to them. So that was the first lesson of entrepreneurship is go where the market is. And eventually I sold enough brownies to get to Carnegie Hall. And that taste of just not having a means and finding a means was, I, I, I really got to say is like the, was the motivation or at least just the proof that it, anything's possible. After high school, I went to Chapman University in Orange County and it was really expensive. So I, I got pulled back and went back to Hawaii. I got island fever. So anyone that's from Hawaii, you know, you can go around that island within two hours. And for me, I was like, oh, I gotta go back to the mainland. I wanna continue what I started there. And again, going back to looking for resources and solutions, I started scouring the internet looking for grants and scholarships. And I found one through Cal State Los Angeles. And that's how I was able to go back to the mainland and finish my bachelor's and master's at Cal State LA. So that's another lesson I've learned early on is there's no solutions or if you feel like you don't have the resources to get to your, your means, then look online, ask around, because it, it is possible. Um, I graduated during the time of the recession. So 2009, uh, or 2009, 2011. So I couldn't get a job anywhere, not even at Starbucks. I, and not Starbucks corporate. I applied for Starbucks as a barista and no, got no phone call. So I went to Japan to get a job. And that's where, um, that's where I learned about the mannerisms of, of Japan. And those of you that have never seen crop sticks before, um, crop sticks is a chopstick with a built-in rest. So you snap the top off of your chopstick and you have a rest with your chopstick. And so being this time in Japan, I learned about um, the hashi or the chopstick and the hashioki. And I realized, oh, this is, this is really valued in Asian countries, especially Japan, China, Korea. So I, I really love what the Center for Asian Business has to do. And um, thank you to our sponsor, Mr. Kim, for having me uh, have a platform to, to speak on this and also the Center for Business, Asian Business to allow students to travel abroad because um, I, I don't, I really don't think I, Crop 6 would have been real if, if I didn't spend time in Japan. Um, I taught English, that was the school at Eon. Um, Next chapter in the career was, uh, that was a one-year contract and I ended up back in Hawaii. And I made a lot of friends with the YouTube community at the time. And this is 2000, again, 2009, 2011. And this is, I would say like the golden age of YouTube when you didn't have your, your, <laughs> your Logan Pauls. And it was just like, hey, I'm gonna play my guitar and it's, it's what I love, it's my hobby. It wasn't like trying to get views, right? It was just, putting out there what you love and, and brands really started to take notice. So during that golden age of YouTube, and it still is a golden age, just in a more businessy type of way. Um, and anyway, I, I started representing my friends in, in YouTube back when they had 40,000 subscribers, zero subscribers. And they're just like, Myla, you're a teacher. We can trust you. Can you go ahead and, can you go ahead and, um, represent us in this space. And I said, sure. And fast forward to today, they have over millions of followers. They, they get paid to do brand deals by Fortune 100, 500 companies, and they get on TV shows. Um, and, and this really taught me early on to, to really have loyalty with your relationships because they really help you out too later in life. And for me with crop sticks, um, when Crop6 was just an idea on an airplane, it was the YouTube community that blasted it out into um, 
the global, the, the internet, so that I could get funding off of Kickstarter for the first time. Um, I was teaching at Cal State LA, running Click Now, and eventually found my way to Loyola Marymount University, where I got to work with amazing um, entrepreneurs and, and Dr. Choi, and everything was really good. So you might recognize a few faces here. Um, at that time, though, I went over to Singapore in 2015. I realized my chopsticks were rolling off of the tray table. And I thought to myself, okay, there has to be a better way so that my chopsticks just stay there. And I was going to Singapore. And if you've ever been on a flight to Singapore between, <coughs> excuse me, um, the, uh, California, Los Angeles to Singapore, it's a long flight. So I had a lot of time to think. And that's how the cropstick invention was first came to fruition. So I'm going to quickly go over these steps on how to bring that idea to life. And through each step, it's, it's important to be mindful of what your mission statement is early on, because as you're creating your product, and for us, it was leave a greener environment for future generations. You can, you can pivot your mission statements later on in a company, but it can get expensive for your pivots over time. So for crop sticks, um, I had teaching background. I had a, a influencer talent management background, but no product background. So I picked up this book, Invent It, Sell It, Bank It by Lori Grenier. And I read it from cover to cover and it talked about how to create a prototype, do rapid prototyping, how to test the market, how to bring products to life, how to sell it. And so I made our first prototype off of a 3D printer out in Hollywood. And then I would um, work with a lot of the students at LMU to get feedback. So if anyone here has an idea and you're thinking, okay, should I bring this idea to life? I, I, I thought of it during the COVID and I think it's gonna be great. Before you invest a lot of your money into it, see if there's a product market fit. See if there's a real audience for it. And you can do that simply by going on Google Forms and typing a question like, do you like this product? Yes or no. Next question, how much would you pay for it? And, and throw it out into different forums on Facebook or you know, different Facebook groups and see what type of feedback you get back. And for me, um, thanks to the students and myself, I found out that over 85% of people liked cropstick. They liked that chopstick with the built-in rest. If that feedback came back negative, like less than 20% cropstick would not have been made. I talked about the idea to anybody that would listen. If we were sitting on an airplane, I would be that irritating person talking to you about this cool new chopstick idea. And it just so happened one of those conversations happened to be with um, one of my close friends, Jay Chang, good friend, but I had no idea his family owned a bamboo manufacturing company. And through those conversations, he became one of our partners and said, okay, let's, let's make crop sticks. Um, so you find, you find your partner, you find your manufacturer, um, and you realize, by the way, and in, early in those days, I realized that, um, talking about market share, um, 80 billion chopsticks are made every single year and 45% of chopsticks are made from trees and trees, you chop them down, they don't grow back. So we decided to make it out of bamboo. And that's why it was totally bamboo was the, the company that we partnered with, um, whom the manufacturer of them. Um, so bamboo was the material we decided to make it with. And still, you know, you think you have your ducks in a row, but you're like, oh crap, I need funding. And so for us, we initially um, got our funding off of Kickstarter. So we launched, we initially needed $21,000, uh, sorry, 20,000, got over that from 284 backers and that helped to pay our for our machine. Now this machine isn't sexy to look at, it's, but for us, it's it's like the, the the spinning wheel that turns gold for us. This, it makes chops. It makes this makes our crop sticks. And through our Kickstarter, we were able to purchase this machine. We we're able to pay for our IP, 
um, and we were able to to get our patent and also uh, put in our first uh, manufacturing order. And then you realize, okay, you actually need more capital the more you scale. And so we got our next initial funding from um, Accelerate UH, which is a venture fund. If you are at an LMU student, talk to Dr. Choi because he also has a, a version of this um, where you can get funding and get mentors. So please talk to him if you have that idea and it's good because there is an incubator program similar to what I went through with Accelerate UH. And it really helped for the next step because I was at um, a conference and by luck, I met the casting directors of Shark Tank. Um, I wasn't ready to pitch Shark Tank, but you can see in my badge that there's these little th things sticking out from it. Those are the prototypes of crop sticks. And after a long application process, and if you have any questions about the Shark Tank application process, please drop some questions because I don't want to go into it and bore you. But if you want to know, I will let you know that process. So after a long process, we found ourselves on Shark Tank. Um, and the timing worked out fabulously because March 2017 um, was when we launched our product with Chef Roy Yamaguchi. So he's one of the advisors with us. And then April 2017, we were able to air um, nationally. And it's kind of cool when you're on Shark Tank because every time zone, when, when it airs, there's like this huge bump in sales. Like every second, there's like a ping, 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 ping of all the sales. And um, I, I, I'm very thankful for this time on CropStick. It was very stressful because it was, I had to stop my honeymoon. Uh, my husband and I were on um, Kauai and we had to cut it short so we could pitch on Shark Tank, but totally worth it. And today, you know, I, I talked about what Crop Six was in the beginning, but the steps to get there um, really, really led the company to what it is today. I feel like with 2020, all of us had to kind of take a step back and reassess what matters the most to us. And for every decision that we're making along the way, yes, you have to be profitable, but for us, if it doesn't match our mission statement, if it doesn't add to that sustainability, if it doesn't leave behind a greener environment for future generations, then we'll say no. Like it's cheaper to make wooden chopsticks, believe it or not. It's like like three times cheaper and it would open up a different market base to us, but it's gonna hurt the environment. So for that reason, we're staying away from it, but there's also profitability in being sustainable. And a quick story on that is um, the story with, with Cost Plus World Market. Um, I put out a story, I, I did a YouTube video about the situation that we're going through um, to COVID. We, we invested in tens of thousands of product right in February and the container was about to land and then COVID happened. And so overnight our customers were dropping off. Um, and I remember like just having that projection, you know, you have your projections of what you're gonna make quarter after quarter. And then because our, our um, everyone that, our, our customers, our restaurants, hotels and airlines, basically the ones that shut down overnight, we had to really assess like, wow, we need to, to pivot. So I put out a video about the situation. Maybe others could relate to it, I don't know. Um, and one person did relate to it and he was a buyer with Cost Plus World Market. Um, he saw us on Shark Tank and really liked our mission statement. Um, a lot of these companies, they have rigorous testing and certification processes to really say like, are, you, are there any chemicals in your products? Um, are, do you have any child labor? Do you assess that? Have you been to your factories? And luckily for us, because we really prepared for all of that, it was really easy to hand over those documents. And um, that, that led, like we're talking about the loads that, the roads that lead to an end that led to um, that type of client. So in conclusion, sustainability can be profitable have your mission statement, 
so that you can bring your team back to what it is in times of crisis, because you, you will want to go in different directions, but it's that, that core of your company. And for us, it's sustainability that, that keeps it together. So um, that's the end of my lecture. Thank you. I believe um, Dr. Choi is going to grill me now in our fireside <laughs> chat. <laughs> yeah, Marlon, uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights and experiences in your business. Uh, probably because of your product you invented, uh, maybe that the Asian cuisine uh, has become more popular. <laughs> I like to think that, <laughs> but I can't take credit for that. So <laughs> to chefs. <laughs> so it was uh, very informative and interesting. I'm sure that many students were inspired by your story. So now I'd like to ask Dr. David Choi to join us and start a dialogue with Marlon and lead our Q&A session. I'm sure most of you already know Dr. Choi. Uh, he's a distinguished entrepreneurship professor in management department of LMU and also the director of the Fred Kiesner Center for Entrepreneurship. So Dr. Choi, now you can start the dialogue with Mylin, please. All right, well, thanks for having me. I'm, uh, by the way, impressed with the number of people actually attending this in spite of a small game going on. So are you guys uh, getting extra credit? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is, uh, it's uh, it's working. And uh, maybe, uh, you know, we were thinking earlier, maybe Mylon's like a celebrity. Maybe she's so powerful. Uh, and that's why it's, we're getting so many uh, people joining us and signing up and joining <laughs> us. But uh, anyways, congratulations on your success. Um, I know business has been really picking up. And I want to thank you for sharing your story. I think it's also very educational. Uh, my first question, by the way, people, uh, in, anybody in the, on the webinar, if you have questions, feel free to an, ask your questions in the uh, Q&A uh, box and uh, I'll try to uh, pick the questions from there. But let me start out just asking about sustainability. Where do you think your interest or passion for sustainability came from? Was it a childhood or something about sustainability that was uh, really important for you? You know, honestly, I was your typical and still am your typical millennial. Like, yeah, I would um, recycle my water bottles because it just felt like the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, I think it and I'm from Hawaii. So you mm -hmm. are raised to respect the aina because you're an island. You share your resources. So I did grow up with that mentality. But I don't think it like that was not the full catalyst that made the mission statement um, what it is today. I think it was. Uh, knowing that you have the power to to choose your materials, knowing and and after doing more research, I learned from that that yeah, there's 20 million trees chopped down every single year to make a product that you throw away after an hour. And mm -hmm. after I read that, I was like, wow, if I make this product, I I don't want to contribute to that. I want to make something sustainable. So I think it's it's knowing that your ideas, you have the power to control how you want to put it out into the world. And for us, for me, I, I just wanted it to do better. Okay, good. So you wanted to sort of leave a positive uh, legacy in terms of um, uh, with, your, with your business. And I think what's interesting is that sustainability is actually becoming a positive thing in, in business. Not, not just like this costly thing that's gonna hamper your business, but like you mentioned, in so many ways, it's something that people want, buyers want, uh, and in a way you could have an advantage these days, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, my prediction, even though we did drop out of the Paris Accord um, the, for the past four, uh, the past four years, mm -hmm. I do think whatever direction, I mean, we're seeing things with climate change. The fires are happening. It's just, it's happening. Today, <laughs> Lots today, of today. Some, yeah. maybe some people had to evacuate Irvine. and 90,000, yeah. And so I think it's just going to be part of the norm for, for businesses to, to be sustainable, knowing that it's, I think it's just going to be like, like checking a box to do business eventually you know another reason i like your story it's a it's a lesson for many people how you started and grew your business so it's not about putting in a lot of money right it's not that of course you didn't have a lot of money but 
uh, you can actually build your business in the correct way by starting small and growing gradually, right? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And if I, if I knew what I know now, mm -hmm. I, I probably wouldn't have raised so much money. Um, we did, we did a series, um, we did a seed round mm -hmm. and I think while well, raising money is a success measure, cause mm -hmm. then you can bring your ideas to life. If I could have scaled that idea a little bit down and just test little over a li little bit over time to your point, mm -hmm. you don't need a lot of, you don't, you don't need millions of dollars to bring an idea to life. Some, some ideas don't need any funding at all, or you can do it off of a loan if, if your business model is, is good. Yep, one second. I, I, my computer, I just lost it. Okay, good. You know, uh, by the way, I was checking your website and you have chopsticks, of course, but you also have straws now, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please tell us about the straw product. So does, we it, have, does it work? Is it get soggy at all? or? So it's a new product. Yeah. Um, it's bamboo fiber straws. They are made from, um, we noticed when crop sticks was being made, there's a lot of sawdust that was coming out of it. So we're like, what can we do with the sawdust? We're yeah. trying to do R&D, but we found a manufacturer that is already doing that. So we partnered with them and now they have this straw. I don't, I don't have it on me mm -hmm. uh, right now, but... Uh, if you go to Bopo Mofo in San Gabriel um, or Pine and Crane um, or any Dukes, um, they have our straws. Mm -hmm. They don't get soggy. They, um, you can keep it in, in your water, your drink for hours and they don't get soggy. And I think my favorite part is you put it into the ground and within six months it becomes dirt. So that's, I think it's cool. No, I like it. You know, the problem with paper straws is, you know, about 10 minutes into it, it gets quite soggy. So, yeah, um, I mean, it is better than plastic, you know, but... Of course, better than it plastic. Soggy. Yeah. yeah. Hey, so, um, you know, of course, this COVID thing hit you probably more than almost any other kind of business. Like you mentioned, you sell to airlines, restaurants, hotels, the business that were basically shut down. Yeah. Uh, how How scary was it? And... Uh, you know, how long were you freaking out and, uh, you know, not knowing what to do? And how long did it take you to figure out maybe I need to try something different? Um, how was that process? Um, I remember when we would just, there was a day I got call after call or unanswered emails of people that owed us money or they were promised us orders. And and I had all this product that we invested in to sell to them. Mm -hmm. And I just remember just crying. I just broke down because it's like, wow, you have a plan and it was so certain. And mm -hmm. now that plan is like just, just taken out from under you. I think a lot of us can relate to that, mm -hmm. whether in business or in your personal life. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember just allowing me to process the feelings and I had this like one line I was always say like it happened I would say it during the protests and then during COVID and then during the fires and it was always like this is insane like it just it's like a little tick that I, I'll do mm -hmm. and so after I allowed myself to like process it I think mm -hmm. it's like okay you have stakeholders that you are trying to take care of mm -hmm. and it's your customers, it's your vendors, it's a, it's a whole supply chain that gets affected from mm -hmm. COVID and, and your employees and, and your investors. I mean, there, we have investors that are uh, empathetic. So we're very grateful for that, but sometimes your investors are, they just want their money back. And mm -hmm. for us, it, it was just making sure each stakeholder is, uh, knows what our pivot plan is whether there's like an A scenario, B scenario, C scenario. And for us, our pivot plan has been to um, go after Fortune 500 companies or any company with a marketing budget, um, for example, like American Express. Mm -hmm. And for them, a lot of these big corporations, they're supporting small business. Mm -hmm. So instead of selling to restaurants, we're pitching 
brands or pitching American Express, kind of like what I do for influencer marketing. Mm -hmm. We're saying to them, hey, do you want to put your products, your your logo onto our products? Mm -hmm. And then we'll give our products away to the restaurants for free. It becomes Mm -hmm. a win-win-win. Restaurants get our products, uh, a commodity that they need to, to use to run their restaurants, and they're hurting. Um, we get our product paid for, and then the brand has um, marketing recognition, and they have to deploy these dollars anyway. So, mm-hmm. um, well, that's that, creative. Has that been working so far? Is that that uh, idea? Yeah. So we've yeah. been in conversations um, with a few big organizations, and then JCB Credit Card has done that with us in the past. So we're trying to reengage that um, activation. So. It's, it's in the works. Okay. Of course, the great news this year was uh, getting into cost plus world market. So the buyer contacted you first. Mm-hmm. And then um, I guess there was probably a lot of back going back and forth discussing the arrangement. How long did it take? And what are, what are some, some challenging parts about it? Um, you know, it was really quick. For mm-hmm. the from the buyer point of contact to closing mm-hmm. a deal, I would say a month. But the work to get to that point of mm-hmm. him, he already knew what he wanted, and he mm-hmm. just had to get like a few more okays. Mm-hmm. But to get his attention, I think took two, <laughs> three years. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it's a process of planting seeds around who your target customer is. Mm-hmm. So. Like we sent samples. He found our samples in a sample closet. He's yeah. on Shark Tank. He forgot saw about it. it one yeah. year, right? Yeah. You know, there was a question about, I, I know that uh, being certified B Corporation also helped getting into cost plus world market. There's a question about what was the most difficult part of getting a B Corp certified? Uh, you mentioned you had failed the first time. Mm-hmm. So um, what was really difficult about it? On the um, legality side of things, uh, there's there's point basis. And one of the biggest point brackets you can get is to restructure your company from a legal or go, uh, yeah, legal standpoint. Mm-hmm. So we had to turn our um, Delaware C and mm-hmm. get it to become a benefit corporation. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and so that takes some time. And Benefit Corporation is a, a legal document that shares publicly what your mission is and how you contribute to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and then I, I, I just remember analyzing each section with our team mm-hmm. and creating uh, a, another big part was um, like we would we would verbally ask our. Um, our manufacturers and suppliers like Mm -hmm. you don't have child labor right you don't and we would go there physically to look at it and just make sure they're doing everything in compliance um but b corp you need everything signed and so it's like convincing your suppliers can you sign this and some suppliers especially if they're overseas they're hesitant to sign documents Maybe they don't fully understand the jargon. So it was like translating it and making sure they were comfortable to sign it. Um, so, so when you were when you were changing from a Delaware C to a Benefit Corporation, you only had investors at that time, did you? Um, no, we were we were operating. We we're fully operating. Yeah, yeah. But you only had, had investors no, as, oh. as a Delaware C. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you have to tell them, hey, I'm changing my organizational structure. I'm changing the legal entity. Yeah. It was yeah. expensive too. Oh, that was expensive too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And they, they said, okay, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, go ahead. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and not every investor could be like that, but yeah. you're lucky. Yeah. Well, I think it takes a lot of, um, you know, good communication with investors, right? Right. You, you keep them, you know, informed about what you're doing, what's happening with the business in general? Mm-hmm. Yeah, quarterly reports. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I always tell my uh, students and other people, you know, volunteer information, that way they won't have to call you and then, you know, uh, ask you tough questions, right? Mm-hmm. And then develop a good relationship by being, being open and communicating on a regular basis. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a few questions. Um, one that, oh, got a lot of attention, okay. So um, can you talk a bit about 
raising money. <laughs> this is always the most popular question. Yeah? Sure. And uh, were you able to negotiate ownership percentage each round? Well, of course you have to negotiate, but um, what can you share about uh, the fundraising process? Um, so for us, we had the institutional investor from an accelerator. So that was, uh, they had a set amount of shares that they required from us. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also had a convertible note. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess in the terms of negotiating, um, the, the note was something that we set. And then however mm -hmm. much the investors were willing to put into that at the time, um, they, they, th that translated into shares. But if it's, so that's very different from Shark Tank. Yeah. Because in Shark Tank, you're, you're negotiating straight up percentage points. Um, I, I don't think that's, I, I'm happy we did a convertible note because it just protected everyone in the sense of like not us not giving up too much mm -hmm. versus them not, um, you know, getting too little or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but on Shark Tank, you're like, yeah, I want 12.5% of my company or they want 12.5% of the company. And you're like, oh, I only want to get a five. They're like, actually, I want 50. And like, how do you value that? You know, and, and you only have that 10 minutes to negotiate it. So <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't negotiate it with our actual investors in that way. Yeah. So the convertible note came as part of joining the incubator or was separate from that? It was separate. Okay, separate. Okay, so the incubator got a certain percentage. Mm -hmm. And then the investors that came out of that experience or whatever, uh, they got a convertible note. Convertible note for those of you listening, it means it's like it's like debt, except you uh, you can convert that or the investment can convert that on certain conditions to shares ownership, right? Have any of them uh, switched to ownership to equity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. they all did. All right. Um, well, okay. Invested after two years, mm. um, but oh, one note on the on the um, on the accelerator is that we did negotiate, try to negotiate those terms. Cause what they'll do is they'll give you a term sheet and they'll say, okay, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. And you as like a, someone that needs the money at the time thinks to yourself like, oh man, I, I need this money. I don't want to like piss them off. So you're right. kind of scared to negotiate, but don't be afraid to put your terms out there. They're used to that. Uh, I don't know, what are, what are your thoughts, Dr. Choi? You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking, you know, you seem like the nicest, most friendly, gentle person. But then, uh, but then you have this, uh, <laughs> you have this, uh, not viciousness, but you have this strength to negotiate and, uh, and be in business. So, so I find that uh, uh, remarkable. Thank you. Yeah. I love negotiating. It's fun. <laughs> That's how I get Thank my you. adrenaline kicks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's, uh, there's the uh, tough side in you. Um, there's a question here about uh, consumers. That's a good question. What role do you think, it's more like a theoretical question, but kind of good one, consumers have in sustainability, you know? So uh, actually there's two parts to it. So, you know, what, so what role, role do consumers have in, I guess, businesses being increasingly sustainable? The second part of the question is, what is something that's a good one? What is something you wish you knew before you started? Okay, so those are really good questions. So let's ask the first one. Let's answer the first one first. What mm -hmm. role do you think consumers have in sustainability? I think consumers have the power to push legislation to, to, to get sus uh, sustainable initiatives approved. And if you, if you look at your city and county, for example, there's, I think Malibu, they banned plastic. So that took the consumers rallying together or organizations to really push that forward. And, you know, there's, there's different views on, on both sides because being sustainable is also expensive for, for businesses. So um, I think research both sides, like, yes, you can be fighting for sustainability, but who are the stakeholders that it's going to affect? And, and, and when you know that, then you can provide solutions on how those stakeholders, like the plastic manufacturers, right? They're like, wow, our business is totally gone. I have I have families too, um, mm -hmm. but if you know how to provide them with solutions too, I think as consumers, it's uh, that's how you can be an active activist consumer. 
And then, you know, like for me, before I did crop sticks, I, I thought I would do as much as I could, which is recycling, you know, just mm -hmm. put your plastic bottle and people are, are watching you too. So you're not just recycling, it's like influencing those around you too. Um, yeah. let's, let's go to the second question. What is something you wish you knew before you started? Um, I wish I didn't raise as much money as mm -hmm. I, I did because I look at it now, but I think I had to go through that process to get to where I am now. But if I knew what I knew now, mm -hmm. I, I, I would have, I, I didn't have to hire an agency to build my shark tank set. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like looking back and do mm -hmm. these little things that you learn with experience. Yeah. Um, you say basically what you said, the opposite. A lot of people say, I wish I'd raised more, but, uh, uh, so I find it uh, interesting and uh, enlightening. You know, one of the things you said was, um, I think you said something about um, loyalty and uh, many of your friends helped you out. What did you learn about loyalty and friendship the moment you started a business? Um, I... I learned how to be more grateful and humble because these are the ones that that really push you to, it's your community that lifts you up. You can't do this on your own. You all know that. Like you can't start a business by yourself thinking that you'll be successful and you'll be like, aha, I showed everybody. You know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's your community that will prop you up. And for us, it was people stepping up for Kickstarter. You can't put a Kickstarter up and be like, yeah, now all these strangers are gonna buy my awesome product. No, it's your community that's stepping up. It was the relationships like the Fung Bros or um, Richie Lee, David Choi. These are my YouTube clients mm -hmm. where I spent years serving them and, and being friends with them too. Mm -hmm. And finally it's like, oh, well, Mylon, you're doing something. I wanna help you too. And I don't know, it's, it's really cool when it happens naturally. You know, I find what you said very interesting. There are some people still who don't know that uh, you need a community to be successful as an entrepreneur. Uh, they, you know, watch some movies, I guess, and they think uh, it's it's a self-made man or woman, right? That becomes a success story. Whereas in real life, it takes a whole village, right? Mm -hmm. A whole village of people, friends. And, you know, when you run a Kickstarter and you tell your friends, oh, please support me, and then two days later, you know they haven't bought anything from you, right? Uh, <laughs> that's when you know who your, who your friends are. <laughs> did, you, did you have any resentment uh, towards people who didn't want to buy or order anything uh, on Kickstarter for you from you? If I did, then they're probably blocked out of my mind and I don't talk to them. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, that, that, that's your, uh, the nice aspect of you that's coming through now. All right. Um, Okay, how do you scale when your options make it difficult to stay sustainable? I guess another way to ask the question is because you're being sustainable, we talked about how it can have an advantage, but the fact is your costs are much higher than these typical wooden sticks, which makes it difficult for you to get into certain big chains of restaurants and so on, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so so, what do you do when, when, you, when you can't... Uh, uh, when you when it's when it's difficult for you to scale as a result of your cost being higher, I'll give a example of that. Where our bamboo straws, I love them. Mm -hmm. I, I think they're the best, and it's it's the hawk, it's the the four seasons that buy them. The mm -hmm. really high end markets, mm -hmm. but again, going back to mission, our mission is to leave behind a greener environment for future generations. So that doesn't mean that um, paper paper can also contribute that to that mm -hmm. um, rather than plastic. So I'm not opposed to selling paper, but as long as it aligns, you, you have to look at your different market segments and see who's willing to buy at a certain price point. And if you don't have that product market fit, if there's no fit, then you have no business. So that, I think that was like one of the the things where 
even when we first started crop six, I had a certain price point in mind and I realized like, oh, well, no one's gonna, I have, I will have zero customers if I try to sell it at that point. point. I'll have great margins, <laughs> but no customers. So you have to, you know, try and balance that. Now, I should, should probably mention to this uh, person who asked the question, there are, Uh-oh, I think I froze. I hope I didn't. Whoops, was I stuck? Uh, for a second, it might've been my end. What did you mine, say? Mine, probably mine. What, my question was, um, you know, there are government incentives and grants for starting and going sustainable businesses these days, right? More than ever. Yep. And, and you're familiar with some of them, right? Some by LA City or uh, California yes. and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a social impact fund that's out for uh, Los Angeles City right now. It's up to $50,000. Um, the deadline was back in October, but it is an ongoing fund for social impact um, type of companies. So please look into that. I, every state has their own initiative. Um, and then um, I, I also have a list. So Dr. Troy, I'm going to send it to you if you'd like to share that with, with the students or whoever. So, sure, sure. There's yeah. a question here about uh, going international soon. Are you thinking about expanding to other continents? Yes. Um, when COVID hit, one of our restaurants saved us, and it, they were from the UK. And um, they, I, I, I'm not sure, like, I think Europe is is having a tougher time right now, but a couple of months ago, they're doing a lot better than us and they were more open. So they they did put our restaurants into all of their um, UK locations. Um, we're also cool. having uh, Monaco. We're expanding in Monaco. We have uh, some de development out there and then we're working on um, a partnership in Mexico. Okay, great. This question here about, I think I can help with this one too. Uh, might be a little challenge, be challenging. Do you have any advice for individuals that are interested in starting a sustainable business but don't know where to start <laughs> and have no little, little or no industry connection? Um, any idea how you might answer this question? I love that question because that was me when uh -huh. I first started. I don't know what to do. I didn't know which what type of connections. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think... When you're first starting, going back to community, try to find that community that has that same interest. So for you, maybe you're like, okay, I, I know I care about the environment. I care about sustainability. Where do I find people that care about the same things as me? Mm -hmm. And you can do this now so easily, like go on Eventbrite and type in sustainability and all these different events, virtual events will pop up or even through LMU or on Facebook groups. And once you find your community, I think it's like thinking of a problem that that um, that the U.S. has right now, or even on the global scale. And what's your solution? And is, does your solution create uh, a a better climate or a better social uh, impact? Mm -hmm. So. Um, I, I wish you all the best on your journey because I know how it feels. It's like you want to do something, but you don't know what to do. And I, I think that's the first thing, find your community because you'll find inspiration from them. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. I think we just, we have to do something. I think we're, you know, we're, time is running out when it comes to the environment. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of people are restless. They want to be able to do something don't know exactly where to start. Um, for those who are listening, I'm not supposed to mention this yet because we're not fully approved, but uh, starting fall 2021, we're going to start, we're going to launch a master's program in entrepreneurship with focus on sustainability. So that's going to be hopefully fully approved in about a week. And then uh, we'll start a master's program and exactly doing this kind of stuff. So, so you can you can get a master's in sustainability and entrepreneurship. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. 
So more people like you are going to create. <laughs> that is, that's really neat. <laughs> yeah. I think it's different, right? It's what I want to do is I want to create entrepreneurial heroes like Mylan, right? Entrepreneurs who make a difference. So my little plug, Dr. Pack, you're here. Does that mean we're running out of time? Um, yeah, I mean, do you have a few more questions? I think there, we can give you a few more minutes. Sure, yeah, maybe, a couple, maybe a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, a couple of short ones. Uh, actually, this is something uh, very marketing specific, but I know, I know you know a lot about this. Basically, how do you use inf influencers to increase product visibility? What's, what's, what's like an effective way to do it? Okay, first know who your customers are because, because one person that talks about fashion probably can't sell crop sticks as well as someone that talks about Asian food. Mm -hmm. So know who your customer base is. And then from there, um, tar find your targeted influencers. So how do you do that? Uh, you can do it on your own by just typing on, on YouTube. There's so many lists now about like top sustainable YouTubers or micro influencers mm -hmm. who care about sustainability. And you'll get a, a list that way and then just reach out to them um, on their email. Sometimes they'll have a manager like my firm or they'll have, they'll respond to you directly. Mm -hmm. Or if you're like, oh, I don't want to deal with a hundred different influencers, you can go to an agency mm -hmm. and you can go agencies, um, advertising agencies or influencer marketing agencies and just type it in. You'll find ones like Media Kicks or Social Licks. Um, MCNs like Studio 71 or full screen, and they can manage and pick and choose the influencers that fit your product. You know, what, you know what people like to do is they may know, you know, one influencer personally who's got a million viewers and they want to pitch them or have them pitch their product, which may be totally unrelated to what the influencer usually pitches. So basically what you're saying is that would be unproductive. Yeah, you could waste your money that way. Sometimes it works, mm -hmm. uh, like, I, yeah, some, sometimes it works, like the mm -hmm. brand gets lucky, but mm -hmm. most of the times it doesn't. If there's no market and a fit, it just, mm -hmm. you're, I feel bad, like, um, I don't want to take money from a brand and give mm -hmm. it to an influencer if we mm -hmm. know it's not going to give an ROI. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, really ask, ask influencers for their demographics and don't be afraid to ask for it. Be like, can I see your analytics? Who's the agent, who's the age, the, the gender, the mm -hmm. location? Mm -hmm. Cause what if someone has a million subscribers but they're all in the Philippines and your target demographic is the United States. So yeah. really ask for that, yeah. Yeah, you know, there's one question I wanna actually get, I wanna make sure we, uh, we answer that. So what's the difference between cutting down bamboo trees or bamboos mm. and trees, right? What's yeah. the uh, environmental difference? I know you mentioned this, but uh, some people didn't quite get it. So let's, uh, let's clarify that. Oh yeah, happy to. So when you cut down a tree, it's gone forever. Trees, you know, wood, tree, and then bamboo is actually from a grass family um, or some people call it crop. So that's why we call it crop sticks. When you think of grass, you know, when you mow the lawn, the grass will grow back. You don't have to replant the grass. So same thing with bamboo. You cut down bamboo, it grows back. And it's four and a half years for a bamboo to get back to its full potential where trees, on average, it takes 20 years for a tree to grow back to its full potential. So um, that's why bamboo is one of the best sustainable and durable resources and cheap resources out there. Okay, great. I think we might have run out of time. Um, last quick question. Any book recommendations for negotiation skills? <laughs> I like the math. I like watching YouTube videos. YouTube um, videos negotiation, okay. Yeah. Um, on Masterclass, there's, a, there's a, a video on negotiations. And I, um, yeah, I, I, like, I like watching and typing in negotiation on YouTube and just getting that for free. Um, we are also have faculty members at LMU who, who teach negotiation. Oh, who, who are they again? Well, including Professor uh, Angelica 
Gutierrez. She teaches sessions on negotiating. So I wish I wish I took that class. Yeah. yeah. I teach that too. <laughs> oh, and Dr. Pack. He can teach you how to negotiate in Asia. Yeah. Actually, I wrote an article on that. So, um, so um, Myelin and Dr. Choi, I thank you so much for an engaging dialogue and Q&A session. I saw very few people left the webinar. So Myelin, that uh, your talk must have kept the interest of the audience. So um, unfortunately, we are running out of time. I'm sure uh, Myelin will be happy to take additional questions you may have through email after this webinar is over. Once again, Marlene, thank you so much for sharing your business experiences and insights with us. I also would like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed our, our program. We'll be back with another program in November. Uh, please stay safe and healthy until then. Before you leave, I would really appreciate it if you complete a brief survey at the end of this webinar. Thank you so much, everyone, and good night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>